All right, we're live. And uh, welcome, Rob. Okay, we're expecting quite a throng this morning, like online, but unfortunately, Joel can't be with us. Oh, he, he couldn't do the pre-recorded homily for us. He's, he's in Perth for that um, big conference there, the one with the English Doctrine. It's also got Naomi Wolf. Yes. Um, she's a hard oh, hitter, isn't she? Oh, she, she's, she's quite an amazing woman, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, have you have you read her book, the recent one, The Body of Others? No, no. Oh, I um, it, was, it was excellent, excellent. I, yeah, I thought I was just using her material yesterday. Um, we had a big family gathering, and they they were all hammering me about me being anti jabber. And I said, "Well, have you read the facts, the Pfizer documents?" I said, "No." Nah. Well, yeah, have a read, then see what you think. <laughs> and Naomi's gone and done that for us. Now, now we can say yeah. what's what's really going on. Yeah, no, she's she's got a war room there with the, with the team, and uh, mm. she's a very impressive woman, mm. a deeply a spiritual woman too, a, a mm. Jewess, and mm. um, yeah, deeply principled. I mean, yeah. I only knew her previously for her feminist work, you know, but um, right. yeah, the, it's just uh, a. I think she's alienated a lot of her traditional fan base through yeah. the uh, tax she's taken, but, you yeah. know, she's maintained her dignity. Connie's nodding. You've read read, read the book, Connie? No, I haven't. It's a very good book, no. you know. I, I was, um, yeah, yeah. A lot in the feminist movement are very pro. Yeah. Uh, that's... Oh, good. We've got Amanda. Amanda and Jason are joining us. Yay. Excellent. Yay. Come in and... Are any of the other team coming? No, they're cooking. They're cooking. All right. <laughs> Amanda is here. You can, if you want to poke your head in here, you can see the. Uh, there, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> Rob is online with us. Now, as I say, we, uh, Joel, who's at the conference in Perth, can't be with us. Sam from Texas should be with us, but I don't know where he is. So, um, as things stand, Rob, you will do the Genesis reading. Right. Sam, if he can be with us, we'll do the oh, – I've got the readings at the bottom there. I shouldn't have the readings at the bottom. I should have the this up the bottom. There we go. Download the – and we've got a couple of other people join us. Who's, who's here? Uh, oh, Karen is with us. God bless you, Karen. Nice to see you. Scotty is with us. Great to have you, brother. Things looking better from better for Scotty. I wish you were out here in the bush with us, brother. Soon, I hope. Karen has added, I do worry about the anti-China stance without looking too closely at the US involvement. Where's that? Is this a reference to the conference in um, Perth? I don't know. He, he didn't say anything. I don't know. I mean, good on you, Karen. <laughs> I worry about it too. I mean, the thought of us going to war with China just seems to me the most insane thing imaginable. I mean, what would we be thinking? Um, she may be referencing war. Naomi Wolf. She may be referencing Naomi okay. Wolf in anti china stance. Okay. Thank you. All right. She's referencing Naomi Wolf. Thank you. We've been talking about Naomi Wolf, who's – I won't go through the connection with uh, Amanda and Jason, who are now with us as well. We've got quite a team out here at Ben Crombie. Joy is here. Joy gave a great sermon this morning on the um, uh, the uh, woman with the flow of blood in, in uh, Matthew's Gospel, which we're going to read later. Uh, enjoyed that. Sam says he's here. Sam, we need, I think we need you in the studio, Sam. <laughs> Unless I got mixed up. Is it possible? Click on the link, Sam. Up. Click on the link. Click on the link, my brother. Join us in the studio. Now, Karen has said yes. So that's yes for the connection. Thank you. Between Sam says, I thought you wouldn't need me. We always need you, brother. We need your wisdom. And we need you to do the second reading because Joel hasn't shown up. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. It's a, it's a, a complete catastrophe. Yes, in regards to Naomi Wolf. Thank you. Uh, Karen. All right. I think we've worked ourselves out as best we can. We let's um, 
move to song. All right, I've got these wonderful choir we've had recently, the uh, Mass Choir. I know very little about them apart from their evidently Indian men and women. Um, it's hard to find much online except for their wonderful music. Over most a likely Telugu. Sorry? They're most likely from Tele Telugu Fellowship. They're hugely strong uh, Christian fellowship in, in China, and these people look like the Telugu from my cursor. They're Indian. Yeah, India. Sorry, te Telugu is a language with inside India and, uh, from okay. a certain portion of India. Okay, you said China. That was the slip of the tongue. No, I said no. Te no? Telugu. I heard China. Yeah, you, okay, China. sorry. Okay. I'm as deaf as a post. Let, let's sing. <laughs> We're going to make it work. Genesis 12, 1 to 9. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse 
and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran and they set forth to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the Oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring, I will give you this land. I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country of the town of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel, Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages towards the Negev. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Rob. And welcome, Sam. <clears throat> I made it. You made it, brother. Well done. Well done. All right. We've got the reading from Genesis 12. We're hoping you're going to give us a second reading, Sam, from um, Romans. So that's just warning you. But, yep. uh, Rob, you want to give us some thoughts from Genesis 12? Yes. Yeah, so Genesis 12 is seen by many people as the, as the God's uh, plan for Israel to today. And, uh, and, uh, but the thing about Genesis 12, it comes directly after Genesis 11, where, where, <laughs> where God had sent all the nations of the world who had decided to build a huge tower, uh, basically to save themselves from God, um, to, to the ends of the earth. Uh, so, so, so on Genesis 11, God spread the whole all the nations to the end of ends of the earth and, and gave them different languages and then he basically in Genesis 12 says to Abraham you are going to be blessing to the to the people to the ends of the earth so it's really connected right. with uh Genesis yes. 11 in a big way and uh yes you can look at Genesis 1 as uh at one and two of Adam being created uh, God's great hope for humanity and then they fall in Genesis 3 and Genesis 4 and 5, you get things getting from terrible to diabolical. And then in Genesis 6, God goes, okay, enough of that. He brings in Noah and, and, and Noah is meant to be the new uh, thing to, to get this humanity thing working. And, um, and then not long after that, Noah basically falls off, off, off the ledge. And, and uh, so, Gen and it gets to a Genesis eleven, and God has has another hasn't had enough again, and it, and and he sends does the uh, Tower of Babel spreading. So Genesis twelve is God's you could think uh, God's third go at giving humans a go uh, a, a um, uh, trying to get them to act correctly, um, and so Gen Abraham was the so the kernel of the rest of the Bible of the the Jewish, uh, uh, what is the air trinket uh, of, <laughs> of, of the the Jewish uh, nation, and, and then obviously uh, Christ came uh, to uh, uh, as as the final as we call the final solution. <laughs> Perhaps we need a better term than that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like the fight. I suspect yeah. that you, like me, have been influenced by David Klein's book, The Theme of the Pentateuch, because um, yes. am I right, Rob? Well, yeah. I was just yeah. reading. I, mean, I, think... I was just reading this this morning. Oh, if you can't see it, no, you can't. It. Ah, the commentary. Anyway, and and uh, on, on and he references David yeah. Klein's yeah. book on the Pen Pentateuch. Mm. Yeah, it, it influenced me enormously, that book. Um, sorry, for those who haven't read David Klein's theme of the Pentateuch. Uh, in a sense, Genesis 12, and you'll have to forgive me, I could go on about this for ages, 
is the beginning of the biblical story, isn't it? I mean, I know it begins with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then you get, as you said, in Genesis 1 to 11, you get these cycles of God created and it was good. And by the time you get to the end of Genesis 11, it's terrible. Yeah. So you get these cycles of sin and punishment and and mercy. Yeah. So, you know, Adam and Eve sin, they're thrown out of the garden, but they're clothed. Cain kills Abel and he's cursed, but he's given the mark of Cain to protect him. The, everybody's going all over the place when the flood comes and destroys the whole earth again, but Noah's saved. You know, and um, so you get the, this pattern sort of, of it starts good, it falls to pieces, and then sort of God sort of does something to help. Yeah. And then the interesting thing in, in um, the Genesis 11 story where you see the whole world sort of banding together to create a great tower and a city where God isn't relevant yeah. is there's no mitigation, there's no act of mercy. So David Klein's solution, as you'd be familiar, is to say the act of mercy comes in Genesis 12 here because Abram is the answer to the problem of, of uh, Babel in a sense yeah. that Babel is the greatest curse that's fallen upon humanity because we can't talk to each other. We're alienated from each other. We're broken into different tribes. There's no longer any uh, harmonious human community. Mm. But the promise given to Abram is I'll give you a place, I'll make you a great nation, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Mm. So there's a sense that through Abram everybody's going to be brought back together. Yes. And that's the yes. beginning of uh, that's the beginning of the biblical story. I mean, in a sense, the Bible's a lot of stories, isn't it? But in a yes. sense, it's one story that starts yes. in the garden, ends in the city. Mm. And what drives that story are these promises given to Abram. Mm. Um, yes. that his name will be great, that he'll have a place, and that through him, everybody's going to be brought back together. And as you say rightly, from a Christian perspective, we see Jesus as being the key player in that process um, of bringing everybody back together. Yes, no, I'm so, sorry, Sam, me and Rob have been waxing lyrical on matters <laughs> theological, but feel free to throw your wisdom in on top. Well, uh, my, my thoughts are that um, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Father Dave, that when God said, you know, after he created the heavens and the earth and everything, he said everything was good. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the only time he ever said it. He didn't. He didn't say things are good again after the flood. <laughs> no. no. Well, by the time you get to the flood, he said everything's terrible. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That's what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So we're not back to that full goodness that he originally created. Correct? No, that's right. Correct. But the promise given to Abram is that ultimately things are going to come back together. Mm. And that, that, in a sense, is the driving theme of the entire uh, Jewish and Christian scriptures. Yeah, it's so in the biblical... Uh, ...work in history, bringing things back together. Right. Wouldn't that, that culminate in the return of Christ, though? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the biblical pattern. The New Jerusalem, mm. in a sense, yeah, so, is we're back, yeah. back in the garden. Yeah, so it's a biblical narrative ends with Revelation 20 to 22, where we're all uh, sort of, it all comes back together, and the tree of life is the center again. And yeah. That, that, yeah. yeah, so, so it starts it's, in the garden that ends in the city, yeah. but the tree of the life tree is there at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. I do have a question, Father Dave. Um, the land of Canaan, and I've only done a little bit of study on this, so I'm not sure about this. Is the land of Canaan, can, can, you know what I'm trying to say, um, Canaan, um, is that current day the West Bank? That's a really good question. My, my guess is it's the whole region, probably Israel, Palestine, Lebanon. What do you, what do you know, Rob? Yeah, so basically it, the land of Canaan is Israel, really. So as in this, in the, in this okay. reading itself, it says... Uh, he he actually, he travels through the whole of Israel basically, which is the land of Canaan, and, and and he look and he looks back on it. So um, he, Abraham gets like a a uh, 
Negev, it finishes in Genesis 12, 9 uh, in Negev. And Negev is the south of Israel. So he's tra traveled from the north to the south. He's traveled all the way through it. And so God gives Abraham a look of, of, of what he's going to give him in that journey. His yeah. ancestors. And we don't want to detract from the the fact too that it's a dangerous journey you know the fact that abram who paul will later call the father of faith mm. you know sets out on this journey it's not like like the journey you're going to take sam traveling through the forests of um uh the us where you can expect apart from the odd bear reasonably friendly reception wherever you go mm. uh Abram setting out towards the Negev is possibly going to come across, you know, Philistines and Amorites and a whole lot of people who want to kill him if they find him. Mm. So it's it's a journey of faith into hostile territory. Mm. But the, the promise ultimately is that one day it will not be hostile mm. and that all the families of the earth will be blessed and we're all coming back together. That's the that's the yeah. ultimate it, promise. From a missionary perspective. Oh, no. Don't be silent. <laughs> There's a lot of smart people here who might want to contribute. Yeah. I just, just want to add in there, from, from a missionary perspective, <laughs> um, Genesis 12 is a great mission, the missionary packet passage where uh, Abraham goes on a missionary journey and and, and then Jesus ends uh, with a missionary command. And it's in the missionary movement, Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is seen to be the task of the missionary. Go ye therefore into all the world, uh, baptizing in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the set is equi equivalent made equivalent to the Genesis 12 4 verse, which is uh, I'll make you a blessing, I'll bless you, and you will bless others. It's beautiful, Rob. I think, man, you're wax theological <laughs> far too much because not only have, have none of the people around me or have got anything to say, but we've got no input from the uh, online <laughs> group at all. So I think we've alienated them all. I um, from, from the peanut gallery? <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't we pass this hand to give us a second reading, Rob? But look, it, it, I, th I think we've, we've done justice for the first reading, my friend. <laughs> We're going to pass the same. Okay, our second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the the heirs faith is null and the promise is void for the law brings wrath but where there is no law neither is there violation for this reason it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants not only to the ad adherents of the law but also to those who share the faith of abraham for he is the father of all of us as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall, be, shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was already as good as dead for he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Beautifully read, brother. Thank you. You want to give, give us some initial thoughts? Well, the, the, the main theme is, is it's all, you know, faith-based. Um, yeah. But, but even with, with that, cause like, a, um, but even, even with that, there's, there's that small section that reads, um, for this reason, it depends on faith in order for the promise may rest on grace. This is verse 16 and be guaranteed to all his descendants. Not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith. So, yeah. exactly what's that telling us? I mean, the, so the adherents to the law, those that adhere to the, the law, it, also. The the, um, the issue here is 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 uh, about multiculturalism. It, it's it's about Jews and non-Jews. What we've got is uh, a background where all the original disciples of Jesus are Jews. They see the story going on, the story, the promises given to Abraham being fulfilled in Jesus in a profound way. And now they're going to move forward as Jews, faithful Jews. And then what happens is when these non-Jews start getting involved, they say, well, you're going to have to become Jews. You're going to have to get the, all of your males are going to have to be circumcised. And some of the guys are feeling they're not really keen on that. Uh, anyway, the, the point being Paul's great thrust was it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or you're not Jewish it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or you're not it doesn't matter if you're keeping to the ritual food laws or if you're eating a pork sandwich God loves you anyway so Paul's whole thrust and understanding which is the main letter the issue he's debating in all of his letters is that you don't have to be Jewish to be a follower of Jesus in a, in a sense um, in a sense but when he says you don't, well, say when you don't keep to the law, he doesn't mean you don't have to be compassionate to people. But he does mean you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to obey the food laws. You don't have, you know. So he, he there was an understanding there where certain things were dropped for the sake of inclusiveness. And, and so that's that's the driving behind. So when he says, he looks, and his point, he illustrates it by saying, go back to Abraham. Yes, Abraham was circumcised and he had his children circumcised, but that's not how his story begins. It begins with him making an act of faith, which is what we read in Genesis 12. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. First and foremost, okay, circumcision was a sign for him and his descendants, but the real issue was his faith, says Paul. We've got the same faith. That's the issue. So, yeah, it's in that context. The father of many nations. That's the point. We're yeah. All, and again, it's we're all being brought together here. We're all being brought together and we don't all have to become one culture to do that. We don't have to all be absorbed into a particular uh, cultural system. We can come as we are. Yeah. That's, that's, and, and that's that reminds me. Yeah. yeah. And, and that actually reminds me of what Paul says in Romans chapter two, where he says, those who ha have never heard or, or even know the law sh show by their actions that they have the law written on their hearts. They yeah. are righteous yeah. in, in front of God. Yeah, so it's a different sort of law. Yeah. But it's, um, I mean, Rob would, Rob would have some insight in this because you've actually worked in different countries, Rob, haven't you? In um, I can't even remember all the places you've worked. But it's always been the practice of Christian missionaries to try and absorb other people into their culture. But it very much um, the pattern of Paul is you don't have to shift your culture. You come as you are, isn't it? Yeah. Basically, the, the main main thing about missionaries is the stumbling stone should always be Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ should be the stumbling stone. It's, it's and so if someone wants to come to Christ, it should not. It should it should only be Jesus who. Uh, they argue with if they if they want to it i mean all these laws and cultural issues they're just laws and cultural issues christ is the center right he, he, he is the foundation of everything um if we try to throw other things in like uh cultural things like what ha ha hairstyle you wear what how big your beard is things like that that we don't want to make that stuff stumbling blocks. The only stumbling box should be exception of Christ, Jesus Christ as, uh, as, as, as God. 
Mm. Just anybody else wants to have some input on this. I mean, everybody's very quiet today. Not much action happening from our online team either. I mean, it, it's got a powerful message, I think, in terms of the the ten, tendency of Christian missionaries over the years to sort of cultural imperialism. Mm, exactly. I'm thinking of that. And that, and that was know. that was what I was taught when I was studying missiology back in the eighties to ensure that your cultural, because a lot of stuff we think is is a lot of people think stuff is Christian, which is just cultural. And uh, okay. you, uh, so you've okay. got to separate culturality from Christ. That's is it, if that's a word. <laughs> I don't know if it is a word, but I think we understand. Yeah. All right, we're going to push through. We're going to do the gospel reading, and uh, I'll remove you guys for a moment and bring you back momentarily. We'll stand for the gospel. The gospel is written in the ninth chapter. The gospel according to Matthew. Let me find it. There we go. Beginning at the ninth verse. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at his tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner, in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. And then suddenly a woman who'd been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up, came up behind him, and touched the fringe of his cloak. She'd said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I'll be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the teacher's house and saw the little, saw the flute players and the crowd making commotion, he said, go away for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And when the, when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Oops. All right. <clears throat> I think we're more familiar with these stories probably in some of the other Gospels where they're, they're told a greater length. But um, there we've got three stories together in that little section. The calling of Matthew, the uh, healing of the woman, the raising of the little girl. I say, in a sense, what, what holds them together is this thing of... Um, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You know, the, the idea that Jesus has come for people on the margins, people on the edge. I mean, little girls don't count for much in that day and age. Uh, and certain, and the, the, the woman is an outsider. Um, she'd be considered unclean, but she contacts, makes contact, literally physical contact with Jesus. And this is the healing point. And uh, Matthew, the tax collector, 
Uh, he's an outsider as well, a hated um, collaborator with the Roman occupying power. But as I say, he doesn't fit the standard definition of poor and oppressed because he would have been rich and powerful but despised. Anyway, Jesus seems to have room for all of them. Any thoughts? Well, I, I'm thinking of how Jesus was, people treated Jesus here. They they laughed at him. Uh, they, they, they questioned him talking to Matthew. Uh, I mean, here's Jesus. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, here's Jesus basically coming from heaven to earth uh, amongst living amongst people and people are mocking him. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, I actually have been thinking about this lately. A, a lot of the stuff that's gone in the last few years, I can see that, you know, I've been speaking out quite blatantly about it all and people will be mocking me and I'm going, well, it's a similar, there's something similar there. Je Jesus was mocked. You know what I mean? Uh, Beware when all men speak well of you. Yeah, uh, that's right. So um, Jesus had to suffer mock being mocked, and somehow I've got to suffer being mocked. I don't do it very well. I get, I get on tilt. Do you remember the old pinball machines? They have, they have tilt, so the tilt mode. Well, yeah, I've felt been feeling on tilt very much in the last few years, and I haven't haven't known how to handle it. To be that means you just stop working, and all the balls fall down the center, and yeah, something like, over. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's not a good I'm, image, Rob. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not a good image. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I hear you, brother. I hear you. The Via Dolorosa is not an easy path to walk. No, that's right. Yeah. Now, come on, let's get some input from uh, some of our online community here and the other guys here. Any thoughts? <laughs> Lean in here, Andrew. You must have some wisdom. <laughs> Andrew's with us. There he is. I've got Amanda with me on this side. Keep another picture for the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come in. Look. There she is. What do you think? Any thoughts bef before we close off our Bible discussion today? Um, really? I'm just saying when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Mm -hmm. So I mean, clearly the Pharisees, I mean, they were terrified of, of Jesus. You know, they didn't even want to speak to him and confront him necessarily. You see, yeah, you they know, speak to, to the space, disciples, yeah, not to speak, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just, um, uh, and, you know, raise accusations against him, challenge uh, what he was, you know, his his. What his, his actions and uh, because it was in a violation of, of their beliefs. Yeah. But at the same time, you can understand their perspective. I mean, what they say, you know, a man who drinks by the company he keeps, you know, I mean, it, it's... Um, he's hanging around with people who... Well, that would predict who you don't want to hang around with. I mean, the tax collector is a collaborator... Well, you know, I mean, you think what happened to the um, fishy French after World War Two the, to the um, those who collaborated with the Nazis? The the women had their heads shaved and the men were shot. You know, I mean, yeah, you don't go and have and during that you wouldn't sit down and have dinner with them, which is what Jesus is doing. Likewise, this isn't the only occasion where you see Jesus has a as someone who's identified as a sex worker alongside him. You know. Um, He's a reputable person. You don't do that. You don't hang with these people. You, you know, it makes sense from their point of view. From, but, from their very limited but, point of view. Yes. Jesus has brought a connection <laughs> and image, and and the and the, and the um, story of the whole Bible is inclusion. Inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. Which, which which was what Jesus came to demonstrate. Yeah. Yeah. But, and and here's one of the. And here's one of the things I always thought of, um, you know, with Jesus sitting down with the sex workers and the tax collectors and other sinners, they never portrayed to be something they were not. Like the, a lot of the Pharisees, Jesus would call them hypocrites. Yeah. 
Yeah. But 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 the but Why these people, been? but these people, they never portrayed to be something they were not. So no, I, I, would, I mean, you think it's it, sorry. No, go ahead, Father Dave. I want to hear your insight. Uh, well illustrated in Jesus, the story Jesus tells of the Pharisee tax collector. If you remember, the Pharisee says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, especially like that bastard sitting over there pointing to the tax collector. And the tax collector just says, you know, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, yeah, he has an authentic appreciation of his weaknesses. Right. And that seems to be more important. It's it's the arrogant and the... Um, yeah. He brings down the mighty from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. But look, I think inclusiveness is the theme of the readings today, really, isn't it? Abram, the father of many nations, everybody's included from all the families of the earth, all those who are scattered through the, the curse of Babel are going to be brought back together. Everybody's going to be included. And here it's the rich and the poor and the the loved and the despised the good the bad and the ugly we're all invited <laughs>